And now, uh, since he's already got the, some more 10-point hardware, I'd like to introduce our uh, HAP champ, uh, Mr. Bentley Pasco. Uh, Bentley uh, has been uh, using his expertise uh, as a uh, hardware and software engineer to apply it to the plant raising aspect of our hobby. Uh, he's also on social media, has uh, 13,000 uh, followers and growing. And uh, as you all know, he's, uh, he's got many, many awards here for breeding plants. So uh, Bentley, I'm gonna turn this over to you. And uh, do you need this mic or do you have- I think we're okay with this one. Okay, I let's hope. give a big hand for Bentley. Hi, I'm Bentley. I'm a member of the club, and I like plants, if that wasn't obvious. Uh, so long ago, I was given advice of any time you're going to do any kind of public talk, establish why the heck anyone should listen to you. My name's Bentley, if that wasn't obvious. Uh, I've was in the hobby for a very long time as a child through my family. We've got a pretty robust history of keeping fish, but not a robust history of keeping aquarium plants. My great grandmother used to breed angelfish all the way back in the 50s and 60s. That should tell you how far back my family has a history with fish. So who am I today? I recently got back into the hobby about five years ago after seeing a video on YouTube of planted tanks. And I thought to myself, I want that. I miss having fish as a kid, and that looks beautiful. That's nature in my house. I want that. But beyond that, what influences who I am and maybe why I'm talking today? I work as a software and hardware test engineer. I break things for a living. I exploit <laughs> things for a living. I destroy, I find loopholes. That's my job. I'm a hyper-analytical-minded person. So if you give me a system, I often try to find a way to push its boundaries and break it. That'll come in later, I promise. <laughs> so why am I here today? We're gonna talk about rainbow fish. I'm kidding, but I do love them. And they go great in planted tanks. So, little story time. How did I get here <laughs> talking to you? I returned to the hobby in 2016. I joined Airstone in June of 2017. I became a GSAS member in July of 2017 just to attend the picnic because <laughs> I wanted to go to an event with a bunch of fish nerds and I hadn't really gone to a meeting yet. Four days later, I made my first YouTube video about fish. Before that, I was a gamer. I used to do weird gaming tutorials. They suck, ignore those. My first HAP entry didn't come until October of 2017 and as you can see here, my first entry was not one, um, it was a few. <laughs> I had already dived in pretty hard into plants and behind you actually you can see my second tank. I got two tanks at basically the same time. I bought this big 135 gallon and uh, this was my attempt at aquascaping, which is why you can tell that I don't call myself an aquascaper because this looks like two different tanks and kind of weird, but I liked it. So that's how I got here. I got my first Master Aquatic Horticulturalist in January of 2018. So from October to January, I completed Master once. Master two in April, started a series on YouTube called Growing Plants for Profit. This is how you know I'm already so deep into plants that I don't believe in breeding fish for profit. I believe in growing plants for profit. We're starting to understand the psychosis that makes this person standing before you already. Hit Master 3 in May of 2018, and uh, obviously I was so deep that not even therapy would help me. So, how do you master aquatic horticulture? Or, in my case, what I really like to call this, from hap chump to hap champ. First, let's take a lesson from a true master. For those who are aquascaping nerds, big planted tank hobbyists, you might recognize this aquarium. Here's a quote from a book from the person that owned this aquarium. External filtration of the aquarium through biological filter media, substrate of fine sand, CO2 fertilization, 
about three bubbles per second, and a weekly water change about half the volume. Does anybody happen to know who wrote that in their book? Takashi Amano. Fine sand, three bubbles per second CO2. A lot different from what we see in an ADA tank today. So it tells us that keeping aquarium plants evolves over time and our understanding, just like my entrance to this hobby, changes over time. So why am I as good as I am? This is my very first tank and a terrible picture of that tank. You can see it, it's a Fluval Flex. I have about two species of plants in it. All of them died. I lost every plant, but I'm never afraid to fail. I learn from my mistakes, that's part of my career. I am tenacious, I don't give up, I am always curious, and you only need one plant to survive. This is probably the most important lesson and secret to success I have had the whole time. As long as one survives, you can grow more, and then you can get half points for them. It's a lot easier to replicate and get points from one plant than it is from 50. This is how we start breaking that system. The only true failing is giving up. Pretty famous quote. There's lots of variations of it, but I believe in this wholeheartedly. We only fail if we give up. The way that we get very good at this hobby, messing up, losing things, screwing up. It hurts, it sucks, but it's how we learn the most important lessons. So let's go over some simple kind of lessons I've learned and maybe that will give you some tips going down the road, especially if you've been struggling or maybe you haven't even engaged in the HAP program, I highly suggest you do. It's kind of like a puzzle. There's a lot of pieces, but if we look at the pieces individually, we can figure stuff out. If water, light, substrate, carbon, I'll have split it, but in the end, nutrients, your macros and your micros. Understanding your water becomes really simple. Test it, <laughs> learn it. It's really important. Our water here is really simple for the most part, especially if you're on municipal water of any form. It's soft, it's a little basic or alkaline. There's almost nothing in it. It's very, very clean. It's great for plants because you can do pretty much anything with it. But in general, when we're looking at our water, we're testing our pH, our hardness. We're making sure we don't have ammonia and nitrite. Hopefully we have some nitrate that's gonna help fuel those plants. And then temperature is another important thing that we need to pay attention to. Some plants don't like to be very cold. Some plants really love to be about 74 degrees. And other plants can't stand going over 80. So as we kind of learn this stuff, we can figure out how to fine tune what we're working with to maximize success. Water hardness can be really complex, but this is the easiest way to look at it. One, we have very soft water, but usually we need to do some buffering to it to help keep a lot of the species of fish we like, and that will impact our plants. So KH, our carbon hardness, that stabilizes our pH. Having pH crashes is really bad, and it's actually extremely easy to do in our water. So having some carbonate hardness there, typically what we're looking for is the ideal, put that in big quotation marks, is between four and eight degrees, which is about 100 parts per million to 140 parts per million, it's not a lot. Uh, below two degrees of KH, and you risk pH crash. General hardness, the simple way to think about this is this measures how much calcium and magnesium is present in your water. This stuff is critical to basically every living thing we keep, whether it's a snail, shrimp, fish, what have you, but also plants. There are a lot of plants that without calcium and magnesium, they'll never establish roots. So when you get new plants and you need them to root in and be healthy, calcium and magnesium are very important. Just like carbonate hardness, between four and eight is considered ideal. Somewhere between 70 to 140 parts per million is what you're looking for. 
You can easily find test kits to measure this, but really all it comes down to is using some kind of, whether it's crushed coral, you could use alkaline buffers. There's a lot of ways to do this. Just get your water up to a little bit of hardness. It will help you in the long run. Just don't go too crazy. Light, this is the next important thing. The best part about lights is for the most part, we're all on LEDs nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of rules that we used to use in old fluorescents that you get to throw out the window, like watts per gallon. That doesn't matter in an LED. An LED is so powerful and so power efficient that watts per gallon does not matter whatsoever. Often you will see things labeled as a like full spectrum light. All that means is that that light is producing light within the photosynthetic active radiation spectrum. It's a wavelength of light that we better know as PAR. That's this area of light that plants can utilize. Anything outside of that, they don't use whatsoever. So basically, if you see full spectrum or you see uh, any, there's all sorts of like day, et cetera, that they use to say that, that just means that the light is sitting inside the photosynthetically active radiation spectrum, and that's what the plants can use efficiently. Red and green light are crazy good for your plants. Blue and purple, not as useful. Blue light actually tends to cause additional algae growth. So if we have controllable lights, limiting blue can help get rid of algae in a lot of our problematic tanks. Red tends to help a couple of important things. Taller, faster growth is accelerated by red light. So if you have like a, the Phoenix Fuse Ray is a great example where it's just white and red lights, expect your plants to get a little bit taller. If you have lights where you have more green light, they'll stay slightly more compact and dense, but it's still really, really helpful. What really matters about light? Be consistent. Use a timer. Don't go, I, I, I go out to work at this time, so I turn my lights on at 8.30. Well, today it was 8.35, I was a little late. Yesterday I had to get out early, it was 7.30. Well, I turn them back off when I get home after I've enjoyed my fish for a little bit. Some nights that's 8.30. Uh, I stayed late to watch this TV show that time. I turned them off at 10. Oh, man, I fell asleep on the couch for a while and I woke up, it's midnight. Oh, I better go turn the fish light off. I forgot to turn the fish light off that night. Use timers. There's all sorts of mechanical or Wi-Fi timers. There's lots of lights that have built-in timers. They're your friend. If you keep your light consistent, you limit algae, and you have controllable growth in your plants. That's a big thing. As we start using too much light, the plants try to photosynthesize for too long, they run out of nutrients and carbon, that can lead to all sorts of problems in your plant. So controlling your light helps limit those kind of issues. And then another thing is, for a lot of plants, Less powerful light for a longer period of time is more important than very powerful light for a short period of time. Most of these tend to be your kind of plants like swords, crypts, java fern, a lot of your epiphyte and rosette style plants, so anything that's planted in or attaches to something, but not your stems. Longer periods of low light are way better for them than very short, intense periods of light. So if you have a light that you can dim and your goal is to grow crypts and swords, dim that light down and don't be afraid to have it on for 10 or 12 hours instead of four hours at like, I'm gonna give myself a sunburn level intensity. So what did I learn about lighting for plants? If we look at each type of plant, we can understand its light demand. That was a big thing. That lesson I just gave you, dimmer, longer photo periods for a lot of your kind of rosette style plants, your swords, your bulb plants. That took me like a year and a half to figure out. When I figured it out though, I started growing crypts like crazy, started growing swords like crazy. I never had problems with algae on Anubias anymore. I, my boost in some cases, some boost lights highlight, some doesn't. That's Boost is finicky, ignore that plant. <laughs> but but <laughs> it's, a, it's a little more temperamental, but a lot of those super popular, easy demand plants, 
Turns out less light, way better. They'll propagate way faster for you. We always think of Java fern as a slow growing plant. If you give it less light for a longer period of time, oh man, no, 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 it grows super fast. Super fast, it will get very lush, very dense. It looks amazing. I have some aquariums that have a ton of Java fern in them almost by accident in the sense that I changed the way I lit that tank to stop algae and all of a sudden the Java fern went, I like this stuff. That's, yes please. Here, let me spread out and take your whole tank over. <laughs> well, I looked at it and I went, looks pretty good. What did I do? <laughs> Figured it out, right? Some plants grow naturally in the shade. So this is very similar, right? Those dimmer plants, uh, Anubias, a lot of your ferns, your epiphyte plants, just basically as a whole category, they grow in shade. And if you give them too much direct, intense light, they don't like that. So if we feign, like we're giving them shade by dimming our light down, they are way healthier in the long run and they propagate much faster. Some plants like really bright light. This tends to be a lot of our stem plants because most of these plants grow immersed naturally in the wild, so they're not completely submerged in water. When you're in broad sunlight in the summer, which is our, our primary growth period for anything, the par is in the thousands, not in the, maybe we get to 120 like in an aquarium. So they're used to extremely intense, powerful light. That's when they grow the most. So if we can make sure that we don't restrict their light like floating plants, we get rid of those, give more intense light for a shorter period. We can control the algae with the shorter period, but that intense light helps those stems grow really, really well. So like our plant of the month, this, this beautiful Willichii long leaf, very fine leaf, bright light. Big broad leaves, less light. The broader the leaf, the less intense the light is usually necessary to make that plant happy. Very fine leaf structure, more intense light. Kind of a general rule to follow. Add CO2. If you have really powerful light, use CO2 because then there will be more carbon present and with more carbon present, we can do more photosynthesis, we can consume more nutrients, we can utilize more light. So a lot of our plants that might like dim lighting, but we don't have a dimmable light, Try adding a little bit of CO2. You don't even have to have a lot, but we'll talk about that in just a sec. One of my biggest kind of tips in general about lighting is you do not have to have the most fancy light you see. Those like crazy Chihiros or ADA or UNS Titans, all these like four and $500 lights, you do not need them. You need the light that fits the plants you're growing. So if you're growing crypts, Get yourself something like a Phoenix Stingray. Get yourself a Fluval Aqua Sky, something that's less powerful. You don't need a super intense light. If your goal is to grow all of the craziest plants Roy can ever find, like Ludwigia Tornado and Ludwigia White and all these super rare insane plants, well then yeah, you're probably gonna need to go buy a fairly powerful light that's gonna cost more than your aquarium unless you buy a fancy ADA aquarium and then well, you probably have more money than me, so maybe I need to learn tips from you. The roots of success, substrate. We can't have success without understanding the root system. So some basics here, you have active and inert substrates. And while I'm not gonna be as complex as uh, Balin was last month, I'll do this really, really basic. You have a couple of different ways you can break this down. You have dirted tanks, which are often referred to as the Wallstead method. Just because it's dirted doesn't mean it's Wallstead. That's the biggest like, pet peeve that I have because I hear it all the time. Wallstead is really, really specific. Whereas you can do a dirted tank. There are potential problems with dirted tanks. It requires a little more effort up front. However, it can produce a lot of nutrients. Very, very cheap for your plants. This can also produce a ton of algae. How do I know? I tried a dirty tank early on. Let's just say I didn't like that mess, but I made a lot of mistakes. The biggest thing with a dirty tank, my biggest piece of advice to do this correctly, 
is have a relatively thick cap over the dirt so that the dirt itself doesn't get up into the water column. Once that happens, it's game over. It it becomes a nightmare and it's almost unrecoverable. But if you have a really thick cap, bare minimum twice as thick as how much dirt you put into the tank. So if you have an inch of dirt, three inches is actually really good, but two inches is your minimum of your cap. And that can be a fine sand, it can be very fine gravels, but you don't want something too coarse. You don't want to put the hot pink gravel that you get at Petco over the top of your dirt the dirt's gonna get up in the water column and you're gonna end up with the mess that I did that made you wanna hurl your aquarium out the window and never dry dirt ever again. You have aqua soils. I like to refer to this as the crutch because they do a lot of the things that dirt will do for you with almost none of the risk or mess. So these are typically some kind of mineralized clay ball. Sometimes they use volcanic ash. They have what's called a high cation exchange capacity, CEC. Super, super important. The basics on that are simple. They pull nutrients out of the water column into themselves and make them available at the root level. Now, Balin's presentation last month for our club members, way more detailed and technical about this. He talks about bacteria and all sorts of crazy stuff. I'm not that smart. I just know that if I use an active substrate, it's a lot easier than if I use dirt or hot pink gravel. You also have kind of alternatives. So these are things like using clay cat litter, safety zorb, turfus. There's a lot of these kind of things that work very similar to our aqueous oils, but can be extremely cheap. There are some risk factors with these, but it's easy to research. Basically put, most of them are designed to absorb tons and tons and tons of stuff. Cat litter, right? It's obvious. We're we're absorbing a bunch of kitty mess. Well, if you don't have enough stuff in your water column for it to absorb, it will strip everything out of the water. And then all of a sudden you've got kind of like RO water and that will be very bad for your fish and plants because it'll strip all the nutrients from them too. So usually when we use things like that, we have to do what's called charging it Basically, you're just enhancing it with a bunch of minerals. Typically, we use calcium and magnesium. If you're really interested in going that route, ask Roy. (laughs) He's done this stuff. I don't, I'm lazy. I I don't know if I've made that obvious. Uh, I rely very heavily on aqua soils. So, what really matters in all of this? Cation exchange capacity. High is good. Things that can pull lots of stuff out of your water column makes things really easy for us because it minimizes the amount of work we have to do when it comes to our fertilization. What do I use? I like to use a mixture of things. So I I believe what we call generally like the lasagna method where I'll do layers of different soils. Typically I'll do either Fluval Stratum, Brightwells, Rio Escuro, ADA Amazonia, whatever I can find of those types of the the most nutrient rich aqua soils. I do one layer of that, a layer of Echo Complete, another layer of the same aqua soil, and I'm done. The reason for this is really simple. Echo Complete is extremely porous. It leaves lots of open room for root structures to grow. I layer that with a bunch of nutrient rich soil so that I can be lazier and it can do the work for me feeding all of those roots of those plants. Plus the mixture in general, I found really easy to plant in long-term. So if you're getting brand new plants, sometimes it can be hard to plant them. This makes it easier, mixing our substrates. Carbon. Without carbon, we don't have life. Carbon is the building block of life as science loves to tell us. So there's a couple ways we can get carbon naturally There's going to be some amount of CO2 inherent in our water systems. When we have any kind of water movement at the top, we have gas exchange. Some amounts of CO2 will come in, but it's extremely low. We're talking less than five parts per million. So what about liquid carbon? Typically, this is glutaraldehyde. It's a great algicide. It's really awesome at killing blackbeard algae or all sorts of algaes. It is extremely poor at actually delivering real carbon to your plants. 
very typically, if you, if you dig deep enough into research, I tried this for about a day and then I gave up because again, I'm too lazy for that stuff. You find out really it doesn't deliver more than about three to four parts per million. Then you have CO2, the real way, injected. You can do this a lot of different ways. You can do DIY versus pressurized CO2. DIY, you typically have one of two ways. You're either doing some kind of uh, <laughs> science lab experiment where you're growing through um, to like yeast and you're trying to do it that way. That's not very controllable. So it typically gives you continuous CO2 all the time, which can be bad because if our plants are not photosynthesizing and CO2 is building up, in theory, we could risk our fish. The other way is citric acid mixed with baking soda. You can find kits like this on Amazon, but they cost nearly as much as building a normal CO2 system anyway. So in general, I would say in the long run, it's slightly cheaper to start, but it will cost you more long term. And then you have actual pressurized CO2, so getting yourself a regulator, going to get a, a tank, whether that's through like central welding supply, a uh, local brew, homebrew store, whatever it may be. My advice for this, if you ever want to go this route, look on Craigslist, OfferUp, any of those places. Find someone's used tank from an old kegerator system. Buy it cheap. Take it in a cylinder, exchange it immediately for a nice new cylinder. Or a used cylinder, but full of gas. Don't buy that brand new, beautiful, shiny cylinder and think to yourself, I'm going to go get this thing filled under this beautiful piece of hardware. That's not how it works around here. They cylinder exchange. And they'll take that bright, new, beautiful canister and they'll give you that kind of scuffed up old one. Always happens every time. I've bought one new once. I've bought used ever since then. Every time I buy new, take it in. I would like you to fill this, please. There's this weird painted thing from Central Welding Supply at the homebrew store. There's your cylinder exchange. What about my, my uh, pretty brand new one? Yeah, you exchanged it. Here's the one that's full of gas. It's, it's in your keg system, right? What do you care? It's for an aquarium, huh? Whatever, you got your gas. Get out of here, kid. I want my pretty one. Bought a used one, took it in, looked like it had had a really bad night. Got a nice new one. Full of gas, beautiful big sticker on the front just so they could advertise themselves. What a deal. You can get tanks super cheap. That's the way, reason why I suggest it this way. Because you, you buy a brand new like five pound tank, it's gonna cost you like 120, 130 bucks and it's empty. Then you gotta go exchange it. It'll cost you 20 to 25 bucks depending on where you go. Buy that used tank, it might cost you 40 bucks. You go exchange it, it costs you the same amount. Now the best part is that when you do actual injected CO2 this way, CO2 lasts you a long time, especially if you go by my next piece of advice. With CO2, there's two methodologies. High CO2, that's like you see in those crazy aquascape tanks where you see the little bubble counter and it just looks like it's boiling pasta water for you. <laughs> and then there's my method. I like to call it American barbecue. Low and slow. 40 gallon tank, two bubbles a second. 20 gallon tank, one bubble a second. Why? Really simple. I'm lazy. So I don't want to deal with the amount of maintenance that comes with very high amounts of CO2 and extremely accelerated plant growth. But at low levels of CO2, and this is probably the biggest lesson I've learned the entire time I've been doing this, which as we've seen, is actually not that long. It's only four years. You can, you can catch up, I promise. I'll, I'll relax, I'll chill out. I've hit 10, that's good. <laughs> but in low CO2, you get just enough. You can get yourself to about 20 parts per million or so. You get just enough CO2 to boost your growth, boost your color, but not grow so ridiculously fast that you're spending two hours trimming a week. You might have to trim once a month, unless you grow some really, really aggressive growers like Rotala. So in general, what I have found, if you go a low amount of CO2, you boost everything but you take away the negative of having to do an insane amount of maintenance. So I've preached this for, I think, three and a half years now. So once I figured this out, it was the only way I would go. I turned everything that I had down. And I really don't run out of that many tanks, by the way. Um, I only use CO2 on four tanks in my house. 
out of 20. So while I have a lot of tanks, I actually don't use very much CO2. You don't need CO2, but if you want to break the system, if you want to really accelerate things, CO2 is a huge help. Now, this, this next piece is really important. Or I can hit the wrong button. That's how you know it's live. Fertilization, understanding micro versus macronutrients. This graphic is fantastic. It comes from Aquarium Gardens, which is a, a big aquascaping store out in the UK. And it's this kind of triangle of power, right? Light, macronutrients, and micronutrients. Balancing those is how you figure out perfection in your aquascape. Put the two nutrients together, put carbon on there instead. When you balance those three things and understand how much carbon's going into your tank, so whether you're adding carbon or not, so if you go low tech, no carbon, medium or high tech, injecting CO2, the difference becomes how much light you need and how much nutrients you need. Low tech, less nutrients, less light. Injecting CO2, more nutrients, a little bit more light. Super high amounts of injected CO2, you're turning it into bubbling pasta water and you're trying to have your fish live in a carbonated soda. <laughs> Solar radiation from a tanning bed and um, just start dumping buckets of fertilizer into that thing, okay? <laughs> don't do that, please don't. <laughs> but you know, that's, you, as you inject more CO2, your plants can grow more, they can photosynthesize more, so they will need naturally a little bit more nutrients. It's like when our fish get bigger, they eat a little bit more. When we have more fish, they need a little bit more food. You can't just keep doing one little pinch when you started with five fish and now you've got 45. That one little pinch isn't gonna feed everybody. So you have to increase that a little bit. The same happens as your plants grow in. If you started and you just planted your tank, it's all, whether it's tissue cultures or bundle plants or whatever you got. As they grow out, as they grow dense, as you repropagate, you need a little bit more nutrition. Otherwise, you'll start running into problems. Speaking of problems, these next things will be your best friends. This picture is your best friend. You can find this online. All you have to look up is aquarium plant deficiency chart. Put that into Google, you will find this and the one on the next slide. Learning this will save you so much heartache in the long run. Macronutrients, this is what this one covers. Carbon, we kind of treat that as its own thing, but it is technically a macro. Nitrogen, potassium, phosphate, magnesium, calcium, sulfur. The most common, KNO3, PO4. Any chemistry nerds in here? Potassium, we got one. What's the other one? Thank you. So those are the, the biggest ones. Then calcium and magnesium, I kind of mentioned earlier, we use that for charging a lot of our alternative substrates, but more importantly, calcium and magnesium are necessary for root growth and root establishment. But you can also get nutrient deficiencies. So if you look at like calcium, a little stunted growth and kind of curled leaves. So you start seeing a lot of curled leaves in your tanks usually means you're running out of calcium in your water. You need to add a little bit of calcium. Starting to get holes in your leaves. Starting to get this, starting to get that. That's what these images are for. I don't want to go on like, I'm, I'm sure Roy could teach you about this for hours on end. Roy is amazing at this stuff. He used to do this fun game in the newsletter where he had to identify the nutrient deficiency and he'd give us all this information. And for an analytical brain like me, it was like a fun puzzle to play with. I did really good on Mystery Planet of the Month when those things came out. This bad boy, one of your best friends. Basically, macros make up a bulk of our fertilizers. They're the most important things. We need the most of them. That's why they're the macro. Next is your next best friend. This deficiency chart, which will teach you all about micronutrient deficiencies. Micronutrients are your trace elements. So other than sulfur, which 
and, and calcium and magnesium, we kind of think of them as if they're micros because they're not in the, the big four, but they're actually our, mic our macros. These typically are dosed in some kind of blend. So if we use like an all-in-one fertilizer or we're using powder fertilizers, they're present as a blend and not individuals. There's a, there's a big list of them, but the big ones are iron, manganese, chlorine, which I misspelled. Yes, perfect. Copper, boron, <laughs> molybdenum, cobalt, nickel. What each of these does, not super important. The big lesson, honestly, when it comes to understanding your micronutrients is that you can identify them. This chart does a wonderful job of illustrating that for you. But if we use fertilizers that include micros naturally, so like all-in-one liquids, if you're not like a crazy scientist and want to do the EI dosing method, you're always getting them and you almost never run into this. But you can use other products. There's, there's things that dose specifically just your trace minerals. We'll talk about that in just a sec. Those can help you just kind of ignore this ever happens. So fertilization methods. There's kind of three, but kind of four. Depends on how you want to look at it. So there's all-in-one liquid fertilizers. That's stuff like Aquarium Co-op's Easy Green, Nylock G Thrive, Dustin's Grow Juice. There's, I swear, a thousand of these things. There's API Leaf Zone. There's all this kind of stuff. There is not Seachem Flourish. It'll be really clear. <laughs> I've complained about this on my YouTube channel, but. Uh, if you want to see me lose my mind, that's a great video to watch. But CCHEM is um, closer to what is the thing we call estimated index. So estimated index is a method where you're typically alternating between macros and micros. It's a little bit more calculated. If you're more science-minded or you, you want to be really meticulous, EI might be the way to go. It typically uses powder fertilizers, sometimes uses liquids. It all depends on what your personal preference is. You can find both. It can be really good at fine tuning things. Just takes a little bit more work. As I mentioned, I'm lazy, so I don't do EI. You have root tabs, which is basically an all-in-one fertilizer delivered straight to the roots. You've got a couple different versions of those. But you have uh, options like Seachem has them, Thrive has them, Aquarium Co-op has them. Everybody and probably their cousin makes some kind of root tab. But you also have DIY solutions like Osmocote in little gel capsules. One thing to keep in mind is that when you're using any of the DIY solutions, they typically include ammonia. If you do not have a fairly thick substrate layer, there is a risk that that ammonia over time gets into your water column and can cause toxic levels to your fish. Can these work? Of course. Do I ever suggest them? No, not at all. Because every time you see a thousand success stories, you see 10 horrific horror stories of people losing some of their most prized fish. And it's because of those horror stories that I never tend to suggest them. However, the real secret is, the deeper your substrate layer, the better, because ammonia at the roots is easier for plants to process. Ammonia in the water column, harder to process. So let's, let's break down fertilizer real fast, just so we understand it. For those of you who have ever seen a movie called Idiocracy, uh, you will understand what plants crave. <laughs> Salt, genius. Uh, so this, this little graph shows you basically what plants actually use. The bulk is carbon. And then you've got nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, our macros. But notice that iron and other trace elements, 0.12%. They use extremely low amounts of our trace elements, meaning that if we just dose a little bit, relatively often, we never have to worry about that giant picture with all those different things that look really scary. So what do I do? AKA, 
learning from screwing up, trial and error. I have killed all sorts of plants. I have two plants that refuse long-term to be successful for me. Short-term, I have found success, but I always screw them up inevitably in the end. Monte Carlo, that plant hates me. I don't know why. I've had it happy for like four months at a time, and then it just decides, no more. And Ludwigia tornado, I have never grown that plant successfully. I will, one day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care if it kills me. Only be as complex as you're willing to work. Estimated index, the Seachem Flourish crazy dosing line, these are amazing at fine tuning and perfecting your aquarium. But if you're me and you don't got time for that, it doesn't matter how much you want to fool yourself, you won't do it and you won't find success. So if you're somebody who very typically say, Dean, he's got more fish to worry about. Plants, eh, not so much. Or maybe you're me, I got about 10 minutes every morning to feed all my fish and feed all my plants before I need to run out the door and get to work. So I use an all-in-one liquid. Simple, easy, fast. I just run around with that little thing, squirt gun in all my tanks, throw fish food at the same time. Easy peasy, brain dead solution. All in one makes things easy, but you can adapt it to complex setups. I've got tanks where I use more complex plants. I've got tanks where I use simple plants. I have tanks where I use things like the Fluval Plant 3.0. It's super controllable, more powerful light, and I'm doing crazy weird things with its lighting spectrum, trying to simulate day. And then I've got brain dead lights that just turn on and turn off. I can adapt how I dose my nutrients to each tank, because it's got everything in it in one shot. Root taps have their place. If you have swords, Potagetans, any of those bulb plants, root tabs are amazing. Doing them once a month for really big old swords, maybe once a week, who knows? <laughs> I mean, you got an Amazon sword that takes up like a 30 or 55 gallon, that bad boy is chewing through a root tab a week. I mean, that, that guy is, is a hungry, hungry hippo just taking them pills down, no problem. But if you've got like, you know, the, the Echinodorus of Flame, the purple knight sword, those little bitty guys that are dark purple, whether you have CO2 or not, they're a beautiful little plant. Probably need like one root tab for every four of them a month. They really don't consume quite as much. They don't have as ludicrously crazy a root system eating all that up. I personally like root tabs when I start a tank. So I'll bury them really deep into my substrate. It helps that substrate absorb those extra nutrients, establishes the initial root system of a lot of my plants, things like crypts, and then afterward, I rely on aqua soils and their cation exchange capacity, that CEC, to pull nutrients out of the water column and do the rest of the work for me. Unless I have something like a sword, then a eh, root tab a month. Something simple, easy. Low and slow. If you're using CO2, trust me, try it low and slow. Last longer makes life easier, and you aren't going through $40 worth of fertilizer every other week. <laughs> That's one of my biggest tips. It, it makes things go great. You can get great color. You can see this is out of my primary plant growing tank. I've got all sorts of beautiful color all over the place. This was on two bubbles a second in a 40 gallon breeder with a not very expensive light and only dosing pretty lean amount of fertilizer. Always look at your plants. If you use those dosing chart, those uh, deficiency charts rather, your plants will tell you what's going on. If you start to see curling in the leaves, you start to see leaves that look way darker than they should be, they start looking yellow, they get holes in them, you'll know the problems just by paying attention to the health of your plants. Are all of your lower leaves dying, but your upper growth looks fantastic? Not enough light. The light's not penetrating deep enough. The plant is shedding that lower growth, so it's not wasting nutrition to try and keep it alive because none of that is able to photosynthesize. So we might look at, if we want to keep that lower growth more robust, a slightly more powerful light, or if we have a controllable light, increasing its power. 
Some plants love certain nutrients. So an example, all crips, all of them, like iron, whether they are red, brown, green, tall, short, doesn't matter. They love iron. Well, there's nothing in our water. So adding a little bit of extra iron, and this can be things like getting Mexican potting clay and putting that in your substrate at first, using some kind of laterite powder or like Seachem's fluorite red, which has laterite in it, putting that into your substrate to act as a continual iron source for a long period of time. Great for Crips. Monte Carlo loves calcium. Java fern loves potassium. Can I tell you every single plant and its weird niche enjoyment of nutrients? Nope. Can I tell you that over time you will learn these if you just pay attention to the way your plants look and they'll tell you that story? Yes. Java fern is notorious for getting holes in the leaves because it's a potassium hog and it runs out of potassium and then it starts getting holes in the leaves. Monte Carlo loves calcium and actually loves to be in slightly harder water which is probably why I'm bad at it. I don't make my water hard enough. The leaves will curl a lot. They'll start dying off. It's because they run out of calcium. Adapt your fertilizer to your water. Now, this doesn't really apply in the Northwest unless you're in the spots in the Northwest where you're on well water. What the heck am I talking about, right? Really simple, test your water out of the tap. Understand your source water. If your pH is really high and you, you register like super high TDS, you probably have a reasonable amount of calcium already in your water and you might not need to dose additional calcium like somebody like me does if I'm trying to keep Monte Carlo because I'm on city water and it's got nothing in it. You might already have nitrate in your water. And if you do water changes super regularly, if you're that person that's like every three days, I have 50% water change because I keep discus and I'm giving them immaculate water. Well, if you already have nitrates in your water, you don't need to dose as much nitrogen. You can probably get away with dosing your nitrogen less frequently and only paying attention mostly to your trace minerals, especially in low demand plants. If you understand your water, you can adapt your fertilization to it. Finally, adapt your light to your plants. I've kind of talked about this before, but it's, I think this is one of the most important things in understanding light is that if you have a super bright light and you put it on plants that don't like super bright light, you are just asking for disaster. But if you build your system ahead of time and you think about it with some forethought, you can usually save yourself a little money on your equipment and have phenomenal success with your plants at the same time. Last one, balance is hard to find. Perfectly balancing that triangle out is extremely difficult, even for those of us who have had a lot of success, whether it is currently, in the past, long-term, short-term. It can be very hard to find perfect balance. Don't be afraid to tinker play around. You tried doing fertilizer once a week and you noticed I keep getting algae, spread it out. If you're in a 40 gallon breeder, you're no CO2, your dozen aquarium co-ops easy green, aka stuff that I did when I first started. You notice I get a lot of algae on my glass all the time and a little bit of hair algae every once in a while. Big spike of nutrients slowly tapers off. Big spike of nutrients, slowly tapers off. Spread that to one pump every day, every other day, rather. Lean dose all the time. The plants always have something to feed off of. They're continuously fighting algae. I learned an important lesson for my tanks. Spreading my fertilizer out helped me deal with problems in that first, one of the first tanks, when I first really started going crazy with plants. As I kind of played around and messed with stuff, I learned, oh, I got a lot of fish in this tank 
This, this tank right here, you can actually see some, I had Kochu Tetras in this thing. I had 85 Kochu Tetras in a 40 gallon breeder. Beautiful tank, tons of filtration. Well, it turns out with that many fish, I'm producing a ton of nitrate naturally. Big bio load, right? Lots of little fish. I changed fertilizers in this tank for a while. I used a fertilizer called uh, Brightwell's Florin Multi, okay? All it is is all your micros plus potassium because potassium doesn't normally exist in pretty much any water system except for really niche well waters. No nitrogen, no phosphorus. Well, I got a bunch of fish and I'm feeding them all the time. They're producing nitrogen and phosphorus. I, I, at one point with this tank, when I changed the plants, it wasn't these current plants, but same fish. I was having algae all over the place. I couldn't understand why. I hadn't done anything different than what I did with the previous plant load. The difference, the plants were less demanding and I didn't think about that ahead of time. So by adding my normal fertilizer, I was putting way too much nutrients in the tank, more than the plants could consume. And now, algae's got something to latch onto. Went hog wild in my tank. I had this horrific hair algae everywhere. It looked hideous. But remember, don't give up, be persistent. Figure out the answer, tinker, play with it. I did some tests. Normally I would see like 10 to 20 parts per million nitrate in my tests, 40. Oh, well I did just dose yesterday. Maybe that's because I just dosed yesterday. Wait another couple days, 40. Huh, tinkered with it, played with it, tried a few things, figured out the problem. Don't be afraid to tinker. All right, now. Well, yeah, wrong button. We did it again. Beat the system. Being more effective in HAP. Handle, accelerate, proliferate. And see what I did there? I know, occasionally I try to fake like I'm clever. Tips for handling new plants. Handle. Almost all of our plants that we get, especially our bunched plants, are immersed grown. They will need to convert to submerged growth. So if you want those beautiful underwater plants like that, you wanna try and get a picture like that in your tank, you gotta convert them first. Give them time. Remember that first tank I showed you? I said I lost all the plants? It's because I wasn't patient. They were converting. And had I learned, long term, because when I pulled the stems out, I can remember this really distinctly now. The stems were still very solid. The old immersed growth had fallen off. It was getting ready to grow submerged growth. The stems were plenty healthy. If your stems are squishy, that's when they're dying. These were still pretty solid. They were fine. They were just converting, and I didn't know better. We have to give them time to convert. Don't panic. <laughs> If a plant looks like it's dying, but it's brand new, it's in the process of conversion. It's shedding its old growth and concentrating those nutrients toward new growth to adapt to the new system. Easiest way, like I just said, if it's a stem plant, rhizome, anything like that, don't be afraid, get your hand in the tank. Feel the stem. If down low it's super squishy, but you get to a point where it's hard, cut right there. Get rid of the growth that's dying, keep the healthy growth. It will help that plant stop wasting energy and make it easier for it to convert. That's assessing the plant state. There's a lot of other ways we can do this. We can look at how, uh, where our like roots are coming in. One of the ways that I like to handle a lot of plants is with stems especially, I don't plant them right away. I'll use some kind of weight or float them in my tank and allow them to grow brand new roots. Because if they have new roots that are new to my water system, they will do way better when they get planted than if I plant them right away and hope that they'll establish roots for me. If the plant is 
starting to grow new roots, it's probably ready to handle your water. If you don't see any new roots and you see that stem starting to melt away, like I said, feel the stem. Find where it's still solid, clip everything underneath that away. Get rid of it so it stops wasting energy trying to save that part of itself. Cutting it will trigger new root growth. It's what happens in nature. A plant breaks, finds some place where it settles a little bit, it changes its growth pattern, grows new roots trying to grab in, anchor down, solidify itself. Mimic nature where you can. CO2 makes this a lot easier. Handling new plants gets a lot easier with CO2. It's not always required. There are plenty of plants that don't need CO2. But if you want to make this easier, a little bit goes a very long way. So similar to what I just said, bunch plants, trim, anchor, wait. Once you start seeing good sets of roots, say like an inch and a half to two inches, grab them by the roots, plant them down. From there, you're probably gonna have success. No new roots yet, don't plant them in the substrate yet. Help the plant. It's kind of that like, help me help you, right? Wait for the sign that says, I'm okay, I'm ready, I've converted. Then plant it down into the substrate, let it grab use those roots to now grab nutrients at the root level and establish all the brand new growth in its leaves. Potted plants, leave them in the pot. Drop the pot in your tank. Wait a couple weeks, start seeing new leaves grow at the top. You probably have roots underneath, get it out of the pot, plant it, attach it, whatever it may be. If it's an epiphyte plant, you attach it. If it's a rooted plant, you root it. If it's a bulb plant, Set the bulb on the top of the substrate. Let it build its own root system down in. Epiphytes, for the most part, you probably don't ever have to keep in a pot like that. You can usually just attach them and not worry. The biggest thing is just don't coat them in too much glue if you're using glue. <laughs> don't, don't, don't give it a, a full coating and, and kill that poor thing. <laughs> this, this isn't shellac. We don't need to cover that whole thing and, and paint it bright red like a race car, okay? A, a little a lot, a little will go a long way, right? Uh, if you don't like using glue in your tanks, then just tie it down, give it some time. Once it establishes its own roots, usually a month to two months. A lot of our epiphytes, Anubias is an example here. If you start seeing a new leaf about every two weeks, it's fine, it's happy, you've done the right job. I just realized how hard that is to read. Root feeding plants. <laughs> wow, made it terrible on myself. Uh, when you're dealing with a new root feeding plant, so like crypts, swords, something like that, before you ever put that plant in the substrate, put a root tab where you're gonna plant it. Give it instant access to nutrition, and then just wait. It'll establish itself, it'll grow, but if you don't give it that nutrition right away and you rely 100% on even a really good nutrient-rich substrate, you run the risk of dealing with some more problems. Remember, one survivor is often all you need. <laughs> if you bought 15 stems and you've only got one, then that's the right one. That is the one that has converted that is the one that will grow. That's the one that's going to be healthy and robust in your tank. I cannot tell you the number of times where I was like chasing rare plants for a while. I was like, well, that's, uh, that's $10 a stem. Okay, how many, how many times do I want to gamble and roll the dice? Three, four, five. How much is this gonna cost? Am I paying for shipping? Okay, I guess it's only three. My fun money only allows three this time. I just need one to survive. And then I'll grow 30. If you start seeing most of your plants failing, the lesson here is really simple. Don't give up. Look for the one that is succeeding. You only need one. You only need one. You could, you could get a carpeting plant. You could get Valisneria, anything that, a crypt, whatever. You could buy a pot of crypts, have like 15 of those little things in there or tissue culture, and all but one dies. 
but that one will make 15 more. If you're patient enough, don't be afraid to let that thing just do what it does. Nature is an amazing thing. It is designed to adapt and survive. Let it do it. Finally, medium and higher light can help with conversion. Some plants, in order to handle the conversion process, need slightly stronger lighting. This is most typical in stems, not as common in like your epiphytes or your low demand plants, but sometimes when it has those like super opaque leaves grown immersed, a little bit stronger light temporarily will help it get the first new submerged growth, and then you can dial your light down if you have an adjustable light and get it back to where you want, and hopefully in that short period of time, you did not magically make algae. I have. It can be infuriating, I assure you. However, sometimes with some of those plants, that's the only way to make sure that they make it through the process. I've had this most commonly with boosts, which is why I say that plant is finicky and ignore it until you've kind of taught yourself enough and then you go, I want to buy boost 937 because that's how their namings are nowadays. All right, let's get to the accelerate part. It's my favorite. Cheat the system. Step one, cheat. Use CO2. Don't be afraid. I know it's expensive, trust me. I know. I'm, I'm that dumb dumb who the first regularity I bought was from Greenleaf Aquariums. It cost me like 450 bucks until I learned better by reading on the internet that I was a dummy for spending that much money on a regulator. But you know what? If you buy a really nice regulator, they're bulletproof. They last forever. That same Greenleaf Aquarium regulator is fueling three of my tanks and has for the last four years without fail perfectly. It's built like a freight train. Sometimes it's okay to spend a little extra money. I wouldn't go quite that extreme. Casual advice, there's a lot of really good options out there, but adding a little bit of CO2, especially if our goal is to earn half points, makes this a lot easier. I did almost all of my work for getting most of my Master Aquatic Horticulturalist awards in only two 40 gallon breeders. Hack, design the system based on the plants you wanna grow. Think ahead of time. If your goal is just to do, be a psycho like me, and my goal is now to play this game, and my game is how many hat points can I earn how fast? <laughs> Have we established that I'm a crazy person yet? If not, you'll know very soon by the end of the cheat system. If you're going to grow lots of crypts, lots of anubias, you don't need very strong light. Don't buy the $200 Fluval plant. Buy the $120 or $60 light that you can get that is not as powerful, but those plants don't need it. Buy the things for the plants you're trying to grow. An example, again, you have a lot of low demand plants. You're growing like Pogostamon octopus, Ludwigia repens, some java fern, some java moss. We don't need crazy EI dosing and like a, a filing drawer full of different chemicals to grow these plants. We can just buy a simple all-in-one, call it a day. Don't go more complex than you need to. Understand what you're trying to grow, design your system, for what you're trying to grow. Avoid. Avoid getting attached to plants. <laughs> ah, this is where we're gonna learn why I'm such a psycho. I, I'm like a slash and burn farmer. I would grow plants, I would earn my half points. If I thought I could flower them, I would do everything I could to flower that one plant. But as soon as I was done with them, I would rip everything out, bag it up nicely, bring it to a club meeting or an auction, and sell it. And I would see it go often. Oh, Persicaria, whatever. Who wants this? Crickets. One dollar. The random person like, well, it's a buck. Why not? 
plan cost me 15 bucks. <laughs> Avoid, don't get attached. If you really wanna do this the way I did it, which is to say like a psycho, uh, don't get attached to your plants. Move through them, cycle through them. If you're struggling with a plant, don't be afraid to just go, you know what? Move on, move to a different plant, find success, go back to it later. Someone will have it, assuredly. Someone will have it somewhere and we can try again. Extract. We have lots of plant nerds. <laughs> Use them, use the events. Sell your former precious plants that you got all the hat points you can possibly get out of them. Buy other plants off the other plant nerds that you haven't done yet. It's perfect, it's perfect. Extract value. Ah, the gamer in me loves this. I'll trade this resource for your resource I don't have. My precious, the new one. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need that old thing anymore. Go on, go on. I find super rare, yeah, yeah. I'll make you a great deal. Great deal. If you really want to go crazy in the HAP system, your best resource for finding new plants is in this room. It is the people who post on Airstone, it is the people who come to our auctions. You will find all sorts of new stuff all the time. And you will find all sorts of people who want whatever the heck you have grown. And eventually, hopefully when human malware is done and we're no longer in a pandemic <laughs> lockdown world, there might even be these things called swap meets. <sighs> oh, well, let me tell you about swap meets. I love them. So many people that come and I get to sell them my plants and tell them why I think they're amazing, even though I'm getting rid of every single one of it I had. <laughs> All to find one or two little diamonds in the rough I haven't grown yet. Yes, extract, extract, it's important. Finally, trade. Yeah, we did this twice, it's that important. Find other addicts. <laughs> They're on the internet. Yes. Perfect. Etsy, eBay, OfferUp. I've found plants all over the frickin' place. All sorts of crazy nonsense with weird names I could hardly pronounce until I tried several times to do bad Latin. And eventually I said, it sounds kind of like it's right. Must be right. Don't be afraid to trade. Find groups of people inside the club, outside the club, in other areas. AGA was like one of the best things in the world because you had all these people who can't get local stores. They don't have the lovely access like we have to Aquarium Zen, Barrier Reef, Aquarium Co-op, all these places that bring in all sorts of robust plant options. But they have something we don't have. Assuredly, they've got something, trade for it, set it up, make a deal, find people that are interested in something you have, find something you haven't grown, trade for it. Now it doesn't cost you money. That's the best plant, a free one. If you want to use the cheat system to its maximum ability, trade. It's all part of that second one, two of them, two times, extract, trade, yes. That is Accelerate. Finally, let's get actual advice instead of me acting like a crazy person. Propagation and flowering, AKA that proliferate part. I could just make you read this, right? I could just stand here, like a very boring human being. Some obvious stuff, right? Stems, we typically propagate them through clippings. We're gonna cut them off. This is what happens in nature. They break, some fish eats them, something knocks into them. Rocks fall, whatever it might be, it breaks off, it moves, it tries to grow new ro roots and anchor itself down. Some of those stems, you can do some dirty little tricks with. Best example, alternantheras, all of them. They tend to produce side shoots as opposed to purely growing vertical the whole time. We can cheat, oh yes. Clip the top, it will stop growing up. It will force itself to produce more side shoots. 
Now you can propagate it faster. Most of your Ludwigia species and Rotala species, if you let it grow long enough to where it starts laying across the top of your tank, it will grow lots of little side shoots. Instead of just growing one up, now you can grow 10. This is how we accelerate our propagation. This is how we start cheating the system of HAP. We grow faster than it wants us to. Can you see where that tester background is starting to show up? Figure out how to play with the boundaries. I only have to double my plants. What if I quadruple it off one plant? Yeah, that's two sets of half points real fast. Rosette plants typically produce via runners. Unfortunately, no secrets here. They're just slow, takes time, and patience. Or does it? Yeah. Tip for your rosettes, mostly crips. Dim that light down. Higher red spectrum. They'll propagate faster. And later, you'll see that. Red and orange light help aid in flowering and fruiting. This is summertime. Red light's more prevalent. Those beautiful sunrises and sunsets, light's stronger. Spring, stuff like that. This is when we tend to have more red tones of light naturally. Mimic that in your aquarium. You want to see more flowers out of some of your plants? You're trying to grow your stems out of the water, hoping they will flower. Stuff like bacopa that flowers really readily. Add more red, add more orange. If you have controllable spectrum, do yourself a favor. Make the plant think it's summertime. You can control it, you can mess with it, you can force it to do things that it might not have wanted to. All because you trick it into thinking, it's summer, look at the light. Or, you know, put it by a window. In actual summer. It's cheating. You probably get a lot of algae. But that's okay. Put it outside. Another great way, right? Natural sunlight does some amazing things. Rhizomes. Typically, the way that we're going to kind of propagate these plants is by dividing that rhizome in half. Now, my big tip here. Anubius. There's the dreaded Anubius rot. One of the things that I've learned over time, and I've confirmed this with a few uh, other fellow addicts, we, we all go to a meeting together every once in a while of Plant Breeders Anonymous. <laughs> if you use the kind of scissors that you would to trim most of your plants, they're not super fine. They add crushing force to really thick things like rhizomes, especially in the case of Anubias and Boos. That crushing force typically can trigger the same die-off that happens with Anubias rot. Use a razor blade. Get the finest, sharpest implement you can. Make the finest cut, clean and simple. It will long-term help you keep those plants extremely healthy. Also, after you've clipped it, if both sides are now cut, very frequently, that rhizome will grow out the side. We've created side shoots. Now we're growing two instead of one. We can grow things faster. That can be really great for that extract part. More plants to bring to auction. Extract more value out of your fellow plant nerds. All those people who are like, I love Anubius Nana Petite. We can farm that stuff all day long. Attach it to wooden rock, sell it like crazy. Ask me how I know. Bulbs and seeds. Usually, this is just a playing a waiting game. Seeds typically require you to do flower germination and all that kind of crazy stuff. Bulbs, in the case of Nymphaea, there's a way to cheat. Most of our bulbed nymphaea, so any of our lotuses, lilies, etc., after that plant has really established itself and has a really robust root system and several leaves, typically somewhere between five and seven, you can break it off of the bulb. Let the bulb sit in open light. It will grow a new plant. I used to have in that big 135 gallon I showed you, I started with one nymphaea zencari, the red tiger lotus. Started breaking the bulb, 
on accident when I was doing maintenance. Learned this lesson. Then I went, huh, how fast can I get this to happen? Started waiting until the plants got smaller and smaller, kind of learned basically about five to seven leaves. Perfectly safe, that plant stays healthy. At one point I had 35 of them all jammed into the one corner of this tank. It looked incredible. Then I started selling them off so I could buy new plants. <sighs> Extract value, trade, right? So for most of our flowering, if you really want to go in this, this is where you can earn a lot of points, but it is a little more difficult. Typically this requires your plants to be immersed. I don't do immersed plants. Roy has an amazing science lab. So if you ever want to learn about immersed plants, that's the guy. But what you can do is let a lot of your plants grow emergent. Set them up in a way that helps them grow out of the water from inside the tank. Now for stems, you just let them grow tall. And especially your more reedy stems or some of your thicker stems, they'll hold on to that no problem. You really find stuff like a lot of your rotales will typically just lay down, but some of them you can get them to prop up and stay up. It's tough, but possible. But for stuff like Bacopa, which flowers super easily, just let it grow out of the water. Persicaria, let it grow out of the water. Once you get to summer, guaranteed, it will just flower. You basically don't even have to think. It just knows it'll do it. You can try to trick it. Sometimes it works. Bacopa Caroliniana works. Colorado? No. It just knows. It's too smart. It's smarter than I am. But if you let it grow out of the water, especially in springtime and you get into summer, it is really easy to get a lot of those plants to flower. Easy points. Now some of your things like Nubius, Crips, Boos, they will flower underwater. That's just about making that plant really happy and red light. And typically, if you are dosing individual nutrients and you're really crazy, a little bit of extra boron. Boron is the trace mineral that's most important for flowering. Random note, how did I learn? That chart. Didn't know beforehand. Started playing around with it, figured out I could make lots of crypts all give me flower space at the same time. So, that's all my tips there. Let's go to final thoughts. Patience. You will mess up. Everyone does. That's okay. Over time, you screw up less because you learn from those first mistakes. Adjust. Do things on your schedule. Do you work really crazy hours and you don't get a lot of time? You can't do four hours of maintenance every week, don't run really high CO2. Don't run super powerful light. Don't necessarily grow the plants that grow at like seemingly an inch every hour. Tile those things back, make things easier on yourself. Use fertilizer methods that are less complex so that they take less time. Insight. Over time, if you watch your plants you will learn lessons from their health. And you won't have to consult that chart anymore. You'll just look and go, holes in leaves, got a potassium problem here. Curved leaves over there, got a little calcium problem over there. This is happening, this is happening, this is happening. Oh, uh, I got these weird dark veins, but leaves look okay. Or leaves are super dark, but the veins look okay. You'll just learn what all these things are over time as you encounter them. Learn from failure. Do. Participate in HAP. Become an addict like me. <laughs> Seek out nature. Bring it home and enjoy it. Your fish will thank you. I will thank you. Roy might not thank you because you're giving more work. But in the end, we'll all enjoy this more. Any questions? So um, first of all, Great presentation. Thank you, Dean. Yeah. Now the questions. Uh oh. Um, your two bubbles of CO2 a second for the 
for the 40 gallon breeder. Yep. Um, does that change depending on whether you're using air driven sponges, hang on back, or canister or sump type filters? No. Nope. Some of those won't, some of those drive the CO2 out. So the, the, the thing that I've learned over time is that the, to me at least, the, the loss of CO2 via gas exchange at low levels of CO2 is kind of a fallacy. There's just not, the, the water isn't so rich with CO2 that it has enough to lose. Uh, that, that 40 breeder, the same one that this picture comes from, had a Fluval 406 and an AquaClear 110 on it. I mean, it's causing all sorts of ripple. The thing we gotta keep in mind is like our atmospheric air has 400 something parts per million of CO2 in it anyway. Gas exchange isn't only oxygen, it isn't only loss, it brings stuff in. We look at the wild, there's not injected CO2 in rivers and stream systems, and yet some of the plants that require CO2 the most grow in those areas. And they flood temporarily, but they don't immediately die the second they flood. You know, most of the time they're immersed, they're getting atmospheric CO2. So often we need that CO2 injection for some of those really crazy demanding plants. But it's not until you get to really high CO2 levels that gas off actually matters. And that's typically where you see those crazy aquascapes where it like, literally looks like pasta water, it's boiling so fast and it's bubble counter. Okay, second question. <laughs> second question. Um, one of your very first slides with um, whoever the guy is, Amano. Amano. That guy. You talked about fine sand substrate. Have mm -hmm. you done that or are you convinced yes. that the other substrate works better? Yes. So um, I've done a couple of types with fine sand substrate uh, and I've tried Crips, Val. I actually tried a lot of root growers on purpose. Part of that tester mentality in me is that I purposely tried to do things that are the no-no in the hobby. Really all it comes down to is it takes more time. Because of the compaction, you don't get as robust a root system as quickly, and often you won't get a super robust root system. You'll get a little bit more stunted root system, but you will get enough to where the plant can grow. Plants will adapt to their environment. They'll pull more from the water column if they're having trouble getting things from their roots, but we can help them by using things like root tabs if we wanna do sand. In general, I would say one of the, the other things that um, you can do to kind of cheat if you have a lot of heavy root feeders, but you want sand, you want that appearance, go to a garden supply store, get one of those bags of fine lava rock, the stuff that they use for out in your gardens on top capping it, they're all about that big. Lay down a single layer of stone like that, put the sand over the top. That lava rock will give you just enough extra expansion. So as the roots dig down, they'll have a little bit more room to grab in and get into some of the crevices of the lava rock. They'll build a little bit more robust structure. It's not a lot, but it's a little bit of boost. It's kind of a small trick. Uh, what advice do you have for uh, promoting out the kind of algae growth that Hillstream loaches and stiffodons and stuff like without promoting, say, like BBA and other stuff like that? <laughs> okay. So um, you, you can do two methods. Method one is Bacter AE, which will kind of naturally produce a lot of biofilm. It's not necessarily algae, but it is something they feed off of. Um, and it's not a terribly expensive product. Two, if you ever so slightly overfeed, but you're really, really good about all the rest of the things that you're doing, so making sure that the light's not too excessive, you're not too excessive in your nutrients, a little bit of extra phosphate can very frequently build minor amounts of surface and diatom algae and you can feed off of that. Personally, I tend to go the biofilm route because you just have so much surface area in a planet tank, especially for things like autosynclus. It's a little harder with like your hillstream loaches, right? They want solid surfaces, not plants. That you can get them enough biofilm to where they're fine. I, I have these huge fat autosynclases in a bunch of my tanks. I use autosynclus everywhere because I just love that fish. Not because I'm trying to like algae control with them. I just love that fish. And they have all the surface area in the world in the tanks that they're in. There's continuous biofilm for them to feed off of. So I always see them and they just, they look like me, fat and happy. <laughs> but for your more surface algaes, 
Uh, the, the one thing you can look at is slightly more intense light and keeping your fertilization lean. That will help surface algae grow, but not necessarily things like hair and BBA. If that makes sense? Okay. Okay, I've got a list, but I think uh -oh. you kind of answered some of them by context clues throughout, so I'm gonna, hopefully I won't double up. Uh, at the very beginning, yeah. you mentioned a video that inspired you. Do you remember which one it was? Yeah, that's continuity by the green machine. It's this really beautiful shallow tank, lots of green plants, this absolutely beautiful red river stone. It's called Akadama stone. Uh, I've never been able to find it. The one time I had a shallow tank, I tried to aquascape. It was, um, let's call it a nightmare. Because <laughs> I'm not an aquascaper. I'm really good at putting plants in place and letting them do their thing. That's what I'm good at. So I get lucky and sometimes it looks nice. But that particular tank was extremely striking. I still go back and watch that video about once every six months because I love it that much. Okay, I was going to ask, um, you mentioned you had four tanks with CO2. Um, yep. I think I sussed out that you have two cylinders, one that has a splitter that runs three tanks. Mm -hmm. um, and one, one of those is regulated. I think it's the Greenleaf Aquarium yep. one has the splitter. Yep. Um, where did you get your other regulator? So, okay, great question. Um, it's a CO2 art. So it's just one of the CO2, uh, CO2 art. You can also find basically the exact same regulator slightly cheaper on Amazon by a company called F Zone. F Zone. Yep. It's effectively the exact same regulator. There is the slightest of difference in the gauges they use in their appearance. But otherwise, it's a dual stage regulator. Always, always, always use dual stage. I think it's the only thing I forgot to mention, but always use dual stage because it's way, way safer. Uh, Do you use like a manifold with needle valves to split it? Yeah, so in the case of the, the Greenleaf Aquarium one, it has three manifolds on it. Um, and that way I can fine tune each one. If you go like either F-Zone or Greenleaf Aquariums, a lot of them actually nowadays do this. There's modular ones where you can keep adding more as you go. And I think they max out at four or five. It depends on the product and who makes it. That'll allow you, I would never use one of those like crazy brass splitter things. They're not reliable because you can't reliably get perfect gas pressure out of each individual one. And as you try to tweak things in each line, it messes with the other lines. It's not efficient. Yeah, I've had one of those dump and kill a tank. Um, so you didn't mention anything about um, turning off the CO2 uh, at night. Is that not something that you do? I've heard people go back and forth on this. No, that's a mistake uh, in that I did that wrong. So yeah, I turn off my CO2, I time it with my lights. It's, it's really simple. Uh, very typically because I do a low amount of CO2 in my method, I turn my CO2 on half an hour before my sun rises or any light starts. So regardless of whether it's a ramp up or has no ramp up, half an hour before because I'm not gonna push so much CO2 in a low method that there's any risk. And I'm not trying to get huge amounts of CO2 in my water, so I'm not worried about really ramping it up to start. Uh, yeah, everything's on a timer. I, I, I live my life by timers. So uh, specifically nowadays, I use the ones made by TP-Link, so it's the Casa Home, the, the Wi-Fi smarts. They're probably the best one that's out there as far as Wi-Fi timers are concerned. But I used to use like those giant chunky manual ones that you could get at aquarium co-op or at hardware stores. But I'm a tech guy and I like the Wi-Fi ones a lot. They're a lot easier. Um, okay, last question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned glutaraldehyde as the liquid CO2. Yep. Uh, you didn't mention Flourish Excel. Um, I was wondering if there was a reason. Uh, just because glute is kind of the cheaper uh, so option. Fl and, flourish. Uh, but it's unfortunately cancerous. I was wondering if, uh, I don't know. Like, well, glutaraldehyde yeah. is extremely cancerous. It's right. a, a very, a thing or? very terrifying carcinogen. Uh, for a very long time, they didn't want to admit this because it was, quote, trade secret, unquote, but that just is glutaraldehyde in Excel. Now, I've heard that they changed at some point and they no longer use glutaraldehyde, but until they want to put that on a material safety data sheet and prove it, I won't believe it because... I, how do I put this? 
Seachem is like the watered down version of everything. They're like the LaCroix of all fertilizers. And I refuse to believe that they would do anything that would cost them more money. And glutaraldehyde is excessively cheap as a chemical in the chemist chemical industry because it is a terrible carcinogen, but it's really good at killing algae and advertised as really good at something else that it's actually not that great at. So in general, I never suggest using liquid carbon in any form unless you're specifically trying to spot treat algae. And then it's really effective. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. One more. Hi, I have two questions. So sure. first off, do the CO2 tanks, so I have a regulator and essentially I've been, haven't been able to set it up because I've moved around a lot, okay. finally settled in. Um, but I have a regulator, I don't have a tank. Do the t CO2 tanks need to be certified? Like, you know, like um, I used to scuba dive and the you need to get the stickers and sure. all of that. If I'm buying a used like CO2 tank, mm -hmm. Does it need to have a sticker? Does it need to have like a hydro test or something like that? Usually, most of the tanks you find are certified. But if you're going through a lot of the welding exchanges, like Central Weld Supply or the homebrew stores, they almost never look for those stickers and just take your cylinder and bring you a new one that is certified. Because <laughs> uh, I've taken an expired tank in before and just been like, yeah, I just need to uh, exchange my cylinder real fast. And I'm like, oh, okay. Here's your new one, 25 bucks. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then my second question is, um, this past summer has been ridiculously hot. Yeah. If you don't have an AC unit, how do you save your plants from completely frying in the tank? <sighs> yeah. I had some of this. I Actually, my plants did better than some of my fish when we had that big heat wave. I lost a lot of rare rainbows. I'm not really happy to admit that. However, the, the best way in general is any of the evaporative cooling methods. So if you've ever looked into that, it's basically just pointing a fan at the water surface, forcing lots of agitation so that you get more evaporation that will help cool the water naturally. There's a few other like weird tricks you can try to do, like using things like a, um, <laughs> a water bottle that's frozen full of ice and literally putting it in your aquarium like a cooling unit for a temporary period of time. Um, but in general, evaporative cooling is probably your safest, simplest method. There's a lot of other options out there. There's tons of stuff online for dealing with that. Um, and I would in general go those routes because for the most part, we don't really have that kind of heat here. Uh, that's kind of hopefully a one-off, but you know, maybe that's more what the, the people who don't like science want to want to say. Uh, science says it's going to keep getting hot. so. Invest in AC. No, <laughs> um, I, there, I think there's probably a better method out there that's outside of maybe my current knowledge scape, because uh, often we're only dealing with some extreme like that for only a few days. And as long as we keep water movement and surface agitation occurring, we'll get evaporative cooling. The only thing you then need to deal with is making sure you're not getting so much humidity you cause mold in your home. <laughs> so a dehumidifier is your friend or even an open window just pushing air out with a big box fan or something like that to help keep the humidity out as you're doing a lots of evaporative cooling is probably your best route. Yeah, or just making it so that whatever your filter outlet is, if you're using a powered filter, is causing more agitation of the surface. So like an example is I love using things like AquaClear 110s or Tidal 110s. I love those two filters. And I will purposely cause a lot of agitation at my water surface, even though I'm using CO2 in tanks because it helps oxygenate water. And also in the case of where the rooms that I keep naturally warm, those tanks don't get too hot. They'll cool themselves naturally. Because plants for the most part really like to be in that kind of like 72 to 76 range. You start getting much higher than that or much lower than that. And for some, <laughs> Roy's shaking his, kind of shaking his shoulders a little bit. But like, that's kind of an optimal range for a lot of our tropical plants. I mean, there's lots of differences there. Like you got swords can handle, pretty high heat. You've got lots of plants that can handle high heat or can go much colder. Uh, you know, Ludwigia is actually pretty common inside the United States. We have lots of cold water all over the place. So it's a plant that can go fairly cold, but a lot of our more common aquarium tropical plants, this is a range they really love. They tend to be really optimal inside of is that kind of low 70s area. So trying to cause agitation to keep my aquariums from getting up toward 80 
is something that I tend to do naturally as is. Have you found that most of the plants will be fine at like 65 or Well, I keep rainbow fish, so I can't go that cold. Uh, I, oh, oh, no. Quit it. Quit it. That's a different kind of drug. Careful. <laughs> but most, most of my rainbows love that like warmer temperature, so I naturally sit in those ranges as is. When I was doing colder water temps, that was mostly moss and shrimp, aka ultra lazy. Moss and shrimp, perfect combo, by the way. Thank you very much, gently a big hand. Thank you. A three-minute break. Three minutes.